Good afternoon. I'm Lee Hamilton. I'm president of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome each one of you here this afternoon for the Director's Forum with the Right Honorable Paul Martin, the Prime Minister of Canada. The Wilson Center is pleased to co-host this special event with the Center for Global Development, which is under the excellent leadership of Nancy Birdsall. Let me also thank the Canadian uh, Embassy, the Canadian Ambassador, for the extraordinary help we have had from them in uh, putting this event on. We are particularly pleased to welcome the Prime Minister because the Wilson Center and the CGD are committed to highlighting the importance and the vitality of the U.S.-Canadian relationship. From trade to border security to transportation to energy, our countries are inextricably linked. But too often the very success of the relationship seems to diminish its importance. Thus we at the Center have a Canada Institute to examine our nation's many mutual concerns. These concerns extend abroad. Through direct action and multilateral engagement, Canada has taken an increasingly prominent role in the world. And today we are pleased to hear from a man who has played, and of course continues to play, a pivotal role in that effort. Paul Martin is Canada's 21st Prime Minister. Prior to his election as Liberal Party leader, he served from 1993 to 2002 as Canada's Minister of Finance. As Minister, he was heralded for his work in erasing Canada's deficit, paying down the debt, recording several budget surpluses, and putting in place the largest tax cuts in Canadian history. He also became a key figure on the world stage, particularly on development issues. As Minister, he helped steer a course through the international financial crises of the 1990s and notably chaired the 1999 inaugural meeting of the G20, an international group of G7 and emerging uh, market nations. Prime Minister Martin first distinguished himself through a remarkable career in the private sector and was elected to federal office in 1988. He is the Member of Parliament from one of the writings in Montreal. As Prime Minister, he has articulated a clear and active vision for Canada in the world as a country that works for peace and stability, promotes international cooperation, and extends a hand to those less fortunate. His speech today is entitled Canada and the world building on our values. Mr. Prime Minister, the Wilson Center and the Center for Global Development welcome you to the Ronald Reagan Building, to Washington, of course, and we look forward to your remarks. Ministers, Parliamentary Secretary, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much, Lee, for your kind introduction. I suspect uh, that if instead of the introduction uh, you had told us a little bit about what you did this morning, there would have been equal interest in hearing what it was all about. <laughs> but I do want to thank you, and I want to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center, I want to thank Nancy Birdsall and the Center for Global Development for co-sponsoring today's event. It is a privilege to discuss with you and with this distinguished audience the Canadian perspectives on some of the more important issues uh, that are facing the global community. Tomorrow, I will be meeting uh, with President Bush. You're not the only one. <laughs> we will be talking about bilateral trade issues like our softwood lumber exports, where our producers, and your consumers continue to be hurt by the inability to solve the dispute once and for all. In fact, just this morning, another NAFTA panel 
vindicated the Canadian position. We'll discuss the BSE mad cow issue, where the highly integrated North American cattle industry requires open borders as soon as possible to enhance confidence at home and abroad based on sound science. And frankly, among us, we are continually astonished at how quickly the border can be closed when pressures erupt in the United States. Fifteen years after the Canada-U.S. free trade agreement, ten years after we trilateralized it with Mexico under NAFTA, we should be able to do better. We have to recognize that ours, the United States and Canadian economies, are North American economies. Canada is the largest export market for 37 of your states. You are our largest export market. And protectionism benefits no one. We will consider other areas as well where a North American perspective benefits both countries. For example, energy, the electricity grid, and the environment, where we are looking at ways to intensify bilateral cooperation to maintain clean air and clean water in both countries. We will also be talking about international issues, including our shared commitment to promoting democracy and human dignity, our resolve to, uh, to combat the scourge of human trafficking, and the steps that both countries are taking to promote security at home, on our shared continent, and around the world. And it is on this last that I would like to really devote the remainder of my remarks. That is to say, Canadian perspectives on how to build greater security for us all. The ultimate human right is the right to personal security. And so the first duty of government must be to protect its citizens. That responsibility is being tested today by an array of threats that is unprecedented in our times. Rogue states, failing and failed states, international criminal syndicates, weapons proliferation, and terrorists who are prepared to act with no concern for the cost in human lives, including their own. Once protected by oceans, today's front line stretches from the streets of Kabul to cities in the United States, from the rail lines in Madrid to cities in Canada. Our adversary could be operating in the mountains of Afghanistan and the cities of Europe or within our own borders. There is no home front. There is no over there. Our approach to security must reflect this reality. In Canada, we are working in three related but distinct areas. Steps within our borders, measures we are implementing with the United States, and our global policies to build international security. Within Canada, we have just tabled our first ever national security policy in Parliament. It details the many measures that we have adopted since September the 11th and what we are going to do further, all to strengthen our security capabilities, including $8 billion we are spending to fix security gaps. Last December, on my first day as Prime Minister, we created a Department of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. I asked the Deputy Prime Minister to head the new ministry as a clear sign of our commitment to make it work across all government departments. We are improving. We are integrating our capabilities in policing, in intelligence, in transportation, in public health, emergency planning, and similar areas. We are improving coordination among different levels of government, and this is a key challenge for a decentralized federal system like Canada's. We are engaging the private sector as well in our efforts. We're cl working closely with Tom Ridge to keep our border open to legitimate commerce and secure travel, while at the same time remaining secure. And the smart border program is working. Businesses on both sides of our border are seeing the benefits of reduced weight and paperwork, uh, weights and paperwork, when new technologies, greater cooperation between us have improved our capacity to detect high-risk flows. For the future, we, together with Mexico and the United States, hope to expand smart borders into areas such as biosecurity, enhanced food safety, and marine security. For Canada and the United States, intensified cooperation, I believe, comes naturally. Our security is indivisible, and as the events of September the 11th demonstrated so terribly, it is impossible to imagine a determined attack on Canada or the United States 
that would not strike at the core of our shared values, of our profound, very profound feelings of friendship and our vital national interests. We have long recognized that the defense of North America is also the defense of Canada. For almost 50 years, we have shared responsibility with the United States for North American air defense through the NORAD Treaty. In 2002, we established a binational defense planning group to consider the kinds of threats that we could face and the possible steps we could take to boost North American security, including joint command arrangements for maritime defense and military assistance to civil authorities in the event of an emergency. Now, a good defense also means taking the fight to where it's needed. Canadian soldiers are there in some of the hottest of the hotspots. We have almost 2,000 troops in Afghanistan, and the current commander of the International Security Assistance Force is a Canadian. We have just recommitted ourselves to extending our tour in Afghanistan beyond the August 2004 date it was originally set for our withdrawal. And we still have major deployments in the Balkans, Persian Gulf, and Haiti. The fact is Canada currently ranks second among NATO nations when it comes to the percentage of troops deployed abroad in multinational operations. Ahead of the French, we're ahead of the British, the Italians, the Spanish, and everyone else except the Americans. Nor do we foresee an early end to the kinds of security challenges that we face. And that's why recently we announced major new procurement decisions to ensure that our military has the equipment it needs to get the job done. Now, in describing our approach, it is immediately clear that there are many areas of common cause with American policies. There are also areas where we disagree. It has always been so. And it is a remarkable, perhaps the most remarkable feature of Canada-U.S. relations over the years that our differences have served to distinguish us, but never to divide us. In the specific case of Iraq, we did not join the coalition forces. I believe that this was the right decision for Canada, and Canadians supported it. But there is no disagreement at all with what has to be done going forward. To this end, Canada has pledged $300 million to, assess, to assist the Iraqi people to rebuild their country and to establish responsible and democratic governance. We're already providing training in Jordan for Iraqi police. And as the circumstances permit, we are prepared to do significantly more in this and in other areas of institution building, which I'll address later. We're also ready, in concert with our Paris Club partners, to forgive Iraqi debts to Canada of around $750 million. And we agree as well that the sooner that the UN can move back into Iraq, the better. Now, so far, the policies that I've described, including the need to send troops abroad, are primarily defensive, designed to counter threats against us. There is, however, another dimension to the debate, one that arises from the need to deal at the same time and on many different fronts with the challenges arising from globalization. Economically, as has been pointed out by the two great organizations sponsoring today's event, the benefits of globalization have been enormous, but they have been far from even, and too many countries are left behind. Even if more people are better off than ever before, the absolute gap between the rich and the poor continues to grow. And we all agree, I'm sure in this room, that this can't continue. I'm sure we agree that enormous amounts of studies and ink has been spilled trying to come to grips with this, the world's greatest, in my opinion, moral issue. Where much less analysis has been forthcoming, however, is on another aspect of globalization. And that's one that touches directly upon our need for greater security. The information revolution has spread ideas about human rights and political freedom that have transformed entire regions. But it has also created tensions, ethnic tensions, religious tensions, cultural tensions, within many traditional societies. And these tensions within failing or failed states, or within those that simply cannot match the world's pace of change, are the equivalent of a tinderbox waiting for a match. 
True security is much more than simply defense against attack. It's a conviction that we will be most secure when citizens in all countries are able to participate fully in their own national life, when they can see clearly that their own well-being and freedom require a functioning state that listens to them and is ultimately accountable to them. The key idea is being functional and accountable. If we have learned one thing, all of us here, over the decades of foreign assistance, it is that countries will not work, cannot work, unless they have public institutions that work. And the best may way to make sure that those public institutions work is to have them accountable to the publics they serve. Foreign aid is important. It is vitally important. But its benefits are clearly circumscribed when functional, accountable institutions are not in place. We saw this in Haiti. Almost 10 years ago, Canada, the United States, and other countries intervened and helped restore a democratically elected president to power. We poured in an enormous amount of aid, and we made solemn commitments to stay the course. The problem was that we did not succeed. We didn't succeed in building the institutional structures that Haiti needed if it was to have any chance at all of standing on its own feet. And so the result is pretty clear. We're there again. In fact, Canada was one of the first, in fact, the first to have troops on the ground. But this time, the international community must stay, must stay until the job is done properly. And certainly Canada intends to do just that. Indeed, as a specific thrust of our role in the world, we intend to focus our international efforts much more than we have in the past on helping countries to build the institutions of modern government that they need to provide the security and the means to a decent life for their citizens. En effet, l'un des volets particuliers de notre rôle dans le monde consistera à cibler davantage nos efforts de manière à aider les pays qui en ont besoin pour bâtir les institutions nécessaires, les institutions gouvernementales modernes qu'il leur faut. C'est ce que nous ferons. On Haiti. In Canada, we refer to the three Ds, diplomacy, defense, and development. This means that we are going to integrate our traditional foreign policy instruments much more tightly, especially when responding to the needs of vulnerable states to build up their own capacity to govern themselves. As Afghanistan has demonstrated, even the presence of foreign troops cannot guarantee security unless there is also progress towards a political settlement. But equally, there will be no political settlement unless security is established. And proper economic development needs both security and political stability if it is to work. The common thread in the three Ds is capacity building in all areas of governance. Too often, people focus on only one dimension and they neglect the rest. We see this approach all the time in discussions of public security. Experts tell us do some police training, build a prison or two, and then once the situation settles down, pack up and leave. Well, that isn't good enough. The three Ds means building public institutions that work and are accountable to the public for their actions, not just policing, but also government ministries, a system of laws, courts, human rights commissions, schools, hospitals, energy, water and transportation systems. For what in heaven's names make us think that other countries don't need the same institutions that make ours work. And what this means is working on many levels at once, at the same time, and doing it in ways that reinforce each other. I'll give you an example. It also means a vibrant private sector. Last year, the former president of Mexico, Ernesto Zedillo, and I co-chaired the United Nations Commission on the Private Sector and Development. Our report contains a number of recommendations, but running through them all, is one common message. No country's economy can succeed unless it creates the conditions where its own people have the confidence to invest in their own futures. And that will not occur unless the institutions that ensure stability and freedom from corruption are in place. In terms of today's headlines, the need for institution building is seen most graphically in Iraq. But it's also true in countries where, although there's been no recent conflict, there's still a need for us to help 
create the requisite institutions or prevent the erosion of other institutions which are already in place. Africa. Africa is an example where leaders are acting to build institutional capacity both nationally and regionally. And they're doing so through their own, their own partnership. That's to say NEPAD, Africa's development. This is an initiative which the United States, which Canada, and the other G8 partners are supporting through the Africa Action Plan. Now, institution building sounds straightforward. It's easy to talk about it from this podium. But it, in reality, it is a very difficult proposition. There's a fine line that has to be walked between assistance and interference. There's a need to promote modern methods without dismissing valued local traditions. There's no one blueprint. But as in so many other areas, there is the old advice, which is to play to your strength. And it's because of this that we believe in Canada that we can and we must play an important role as countries in stress come to grips with the need to build the institutions of modern governance. When I think of Canadian think strengths, I think of the very beginnings of our country. The British North America Act of 1867, which was our first constitution, granted to Parliament the power to legislate for the peace, the order, and good government of Canada, of, of, of the country. Now, I understand in terms of the beginnings of the American Revolution and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that this is not necessarily a phrase that will set the pulse ra ra racing. But let me tell you, peace, order, and good in government is not a bad thing when you're building for the long haul. As times have changed, Canadian expectations of government have changed as well. But peace, order, and good government have always served as clear standards by which we can measure the success of our institutions. There's another strength as well we have that goes back to our founding. When we began as a country, we managed to bind together in one political community two major linguistic groups and two major religious denominations. And over the years, we've added to this a rich tapestry of other languages, other ethnicities, and other religions. And we've striven to address the concerns and the claims of our Aboriginal peoples. Now, some like to say that Canada was one of the first postmodern states, one of the first countries to explicitly reject the notion that a state consists of one people, one ethnic group, with one language and one culture. Canada's never described itself as a melting pot. Instead, we've always talked of ourselves as a mosaic. And perhaps that's why countries like Sri Lanka have turned to Canadian experts for help in developing a federal solution to their intercommunal strife. And thus, as a major industrialized nation, but never a colonial nor a superpower, I believe that we have certain unique advantages as we focus much more than we have in the past on institution building as the essential foundation for a secure modern state, advantages that we intend to exercise as a major foreign policy thrust. Now, so far, I have talked about institution building and better governance within countries, but that's only part of the story. There's also an urgent need to make international systems and multilateral systems work effectively. The fact is we do need better international governance to help spread the benefits of globalization more equitably, while also helping countries offset some of its inevitable costs. There are many people here in this room from the great multilateral institutions. We need multilateral institutions that work because despite their many frustrations, they carry a legitimacy that no one country can muster on its own. They stand for the principles that every country deserves a seat at the table, that has legitimate interests to be met and values to be respected. Now it's easy to complain that this or that institution isn't working, but I think it's time for us to stop passing the buck. Multilateral institutions are us. They are the sovereign member states. We are accountable for whether they work or not. And most of us would agree the reform of the many institutions within and without of the UN family is necessary. And I'm not going to take time today to belabor the obvious. In fact, I suspect that most of you could detail those reforms better than I. But there is, however, one proposal that I would like to raise. The responsibility for good international governance falls ultimately upon the shoulders of the political leaders of the world's sovereign governance. There's a real problem here. 
Many of today's international organizations are not designed to facilitate the kinds of informal political debates that has to occur between politicians. In short, you can't ask leaders to make the kinds of bold decisions that are required if international fora remain focused only on ratifying the product of bureaucratic negotiation. The most fruitful exchanges between leaders often take place in the corridors of great meetings, one-on-one, -on -one, far removed from the actual agenda. And in fact, you know, speaking ad lib, I mean, what happens to most of us as politicians when we go to the meeting, we're given the briefing books, the stuff we're supposed to say publicly, and then we're given the more important brief briefing books, the stuff we're supposed to say in corridors privately. When leaders do meet in international fora, it's difficult to break free of the briefing book syndrome and get down to brass tacks to thinking outside of the box. Bureaucrats and diplomats can only take an issue so far, but they can't take it further. Political leaders have got to stop hiding behind them, and they've got to be prepared to make the leap that is so often required if you're going to break an intellectual, an emotional, or a historical impasse. Photo ops are no substitute for political will. We've got to find ways for political leadership to work with each other internationally, the way they work with different political constituencies at home, debating, exploring, searching for value-driven solutions, solutions that are inclusive, rather than divisive, stabilizing, rather than destructive, pragmatic, rather than ideological. So how do we get there? Well, one approach that I have put forward would be to look at the lessons learned from the group of, G uh, 20, uh, the group of 20 finance ministers that was formed in the wake of the 1997 Asian financial crisis. At that time, we foresaw an informal gathering of finance ministers representing established, and emerging centers of influence and coming from very different political, economic, cultural, and religious traditions. We wanted to bridge the us versus them mentality that bedeviled so many international meetings. And it's worked remarkably well because peer pressure is often a very effective way to force decisions. And we believe that a similar approach among leaders could help crack some of the tissue, toughest issues that we have to face as a world. What you have to do is to get the right mix of countries in the same room talking without set scripts. Now, we're not proposing a new bricks and mortar institution here, but we do believe that a new approach directly involving political leaders could help break a lot of log jams. And I would suggest that initially we should convene a select group of countries from the North and the South, tackling just one issue and see where that takes us. Could be global terrorism, it could be global public health. For instance, the United States, Canada, other G8 countries working with the United Nations have done much to develop a humane response to the AIDS crisis in Africa. In Canada, our parliament is legislating changes to allow Canadian companies to provide generic anti-HIV drugs to African countries at low cost. We are the first industrialized country to bring forth groundbreaking legislation of this kind. And I'm very proud of this. But the need for cheap medicine goes well beyond AIDS and goes well beyond Africa. The question is, can we find a balance, can we not find a balance between the clear need for intellectual property rights that underwrite much of our medical research and the equally clear need to help alleviate suffering among people who cannot afford the fruits of that research? There are other, leaders, other issues as well that a leader G20 could deal with such as rescuing the current round of the multilateral trade negotiations where the biggest single stumbling block is agriculture. Agriculture is not simply a trade issue. It is not an issue that is going to be decided solely by trade ministers on economic merit. In countries like France, Japan and the United States, it is first and foremost a political issue. And it is one which only political leaders can decide at the highest level. Everyone agrees that the failure of the Doha round is in no one's interest, and yet failure looms. As if talks collapse, then many countries, rightly or wrongly, will feel that although the international systems that we have built up over the decades may work for some, they don't work for them. And this is a bad message to be sending, especially when we are trying as a matter of the utmost importance to our security as nations to reassure countries that we care about their futures and that we care to extend the benefits of globalization to them and see them prosper. Clearly, our multilateral institutions need help. And clearly, we must proceed with major institutional reforms, and we must begin now. 
But that being said, we all know the reform will take time, and we can't let that become an excuse for inaction. The fact is we have to pursue a two-track approach. One approach, multilateral institutional reform. The other is dealing with urgent issues such as clean water, infectious diseases, market access for agriculture, and global terrorism. And indeed, I believe that if we begin to seriously address these pressing dilemmas, I believe it will facilitate overdue institutional reform. In short, let form follow function. We face a lot of tough issues. You deal with them all every day. So let me just mention one more to illustrate that I believe that institutional reform and the need to resolve specific issues are mutually reinforcing objectives, all within the context of the basic discussion, how do we provide our citizens with greater security? Much of the discussion about good governance, both within countries and internationally, we assume that most governments would, prepare, would want to work well on behalf of their citizens rather than remaining apart in some kind of wretched isolation. But as we know, this is not always the case. The question is, what about those countries who were unwilling to take the first steps towards responsible national or global citizenship? What do we do when their populations face hum humanitarian catastrophe? What do we do when people are confronted by a culture of hate and violence that is spawned by their own government, as was the case in Rwanda? If a nation violates all accepted standards of responsible behavior, the question is, do we, the international community, have a responsibility to protect, in this case to protect a country's people from its own government? A recent international commission reported to the United Nations that we do have that responsibility, and it set out various types of acceptable interventions, including measures such as sanctions, military action under certain conditions, including acting under the right authority. We in Canada find ourselves very much in agreement with Kofi Annan when he said, and I quote, Surely no legal principle, not even sovereignty, can ever shield crimes against humanity. We believe that human intervention under compelling circumstances such as Rwanda or Kosovo is warranted. We reject the argument that state sovereignty confers absolute immunity. Lorsque les circonstances l'exigent, comme ce fut le cas au Rwanda ou au Kosovo, les interventions humanitaires sont justifiables. Nous ne souscrivons pas à la thèse voulant que les États jouissent d'une immunité absolue en vertu du principe de la souveraineté étatique. As Nobel Peace, Peace Laureate Elie Wiesel said, neutrality always means coming down on the side of the victimizer, never on the side of the victim. So what's required is an open discussion, but the need for intervention in situations that offend the most basic precepts of our common humanity. We need a clear agreement on principles to help determine when it's appropriate to use force in support of humanitarian objectives. Now, some may say that all of this takes us far from the security agreement, the security agenda that we in North America must have in place to protect our own citizens. Well, I don't believe this is the case, and I suspect neither do you. So in summary, the points that I would make are quite straightforward. First, in terms of North America, we must protect our borders, and I can assure you that Canada will do more than its share. Second, the best protection we can have at home is a world that works. In here, the capacity and hence the responsibility of each of our countries varies. Canada, we are not a superpower. That's true, but as I mentioned, this can be an advantage, and it is one that we intend to exercise. Seen holistically, rather than piecemeal, the decisions that we make as a world will determine whether all of the advances that we have made in recent decades can work for everyone, or whether hundreds of millions, perhaps billions, of people will be left behind forever. We have to demonstrate to people around the planet that international systems can be made to work for everyone. We have to give every person a stake in good governance internationally, but we have to give them a good stake, a stake in governance at home. We have a duty to protect our citizens, but other governments have a duty to protect their citizens, and we've got to give them the capacity to do so. And day by day, it becomes clear that our long-term security requires the spread of freedom around the world. Freedom from oppression, freedom from corruption, freedom from hunger and ignorance and, and, and hopelessness. Freedom for everyone to live a secure 
a prosperous and productive life. Fundamentally, we cannot ignore the very real threats that are posed by terrorists and political thugs who find their genesis not in poverty, but in hate. But equally, we cannot ignore the long-term security imperative to build a more equitable and safe world for everyone on the planet. Thank you very much. Mr. Prime Minister, they liked it. Uh, it is really a great privilege for me as President of the Center for Global Development to share the stage with two of the 21st century's great political leaders, men of vision. I want to thank the staff of the Woodrow Wilson Center for the tremendous amount of work they did and for giving us the chance to co-host with them this great event. It reminded me that small countries can matter a lot if they have great leaders uh, who are willing to take the global stage. I can't say better anything that the Prime Minister brought here today, but I do want to repeat a few points I want all of us to remember particularly those of us most concerned with the welfare of the 80% of people in the developing world. He talked about institution building in fragile and failing states. He talked about the need to reform the system of global governance, in particular the multilateral institutions. He talked about fairness in the way we manage our global agricultural regime. He talked about the health and well-being of people in the poorest countries. And I think he brought it all together because he is a Canadian in Washington by reminding us of our shared responsibilities, Canadians and Americans, I'm not sure what we call ourselves, and citizens and residents of the United States, since we are all Americans, our shared responsibilities as two of the richest countries in the world in finding a way to take his vision and his specific ideas for change and reform and make them real so that lives of people all over the world can be better. Thank you very much to all of you for participating and to the Prime Minister. <clears throat>